Okay, so a very warm welcome to everybody here and thank you for traveling probably from some distance, many of you, and also from locally. And it's wonderful to see so many familiar faces and also new faces. And hopefully it's nice for you to be looking in this direction and seeing three members of the Sangha, including Ajahn Brahmali, who's come all the way from Perth only two days ago, I think. And uh, yeah, already been bringing benefit wherever we've been giving Dhamma. So that was great. Last night we managed to bring someone in from the street. We didn't try, <laughs> but they followed us. <laughs> so I don't know if anyone here has um, just happened to find their way in tonight or whether... Uh, you all plan to be here. Either way, this is a bit in and out, isn't it? Going in and out? Yeah? Mm. I'll hold it dead still. All right. Dead still. Anyway, for those who don't know, I'm Venerable Chanda. This is Venerable Upeka. And this is our teacher, Ajahn Brahmali, who is here to uh, share the Dhamma. And uh, I never usually say much about Ajahn Brahmali because I presume everybody knows, but he has been a monk since 1994. 96, yeah. 96, fully yeah. ordained yeah. in Perth with Ajahn Brahm. And uh, he is known for his remarkable scholarship, in-depth scholarship of the early Buddhist suttas, but also the comparative studies with the Chinese. And uh, also he was awarded an honorary PhD from Chulalongkorn University in Bangkok for his uh, translations of the Vinaya, which is the uh, monastic code of discipline and ways that we basically run the Sangha. And uh, this is a real accolade to his hard work and practice over many years. And also a really good um, uh, acknowledgement, I suppose, of his expertise in that area, which includes the ordination of bhikkhunis, of fully ordained nuns. So he's very supportive of bhikkhuni ordination and has been quite a pioneer in that regard as well. So he's come to, of course, share the Dhamma, but also give our project a little bit of support. So we're trying to, um, we have actually found a monastery that we now uh, dwell in, in Oxford, in Boar's Hill. And the next step really is to grow a bhikkhuni sangha to give opportunities for women to take the full ordination. But for everybody here to be part of a beautiful community that try to live a life aligned to the Buddha's teachings as far as we can understand them and practice them and to help each other in our understanding and practice thereof. So it's a beautiful project and I hope that many of you uh, continue to be connected to us and uh, feel worthy enough to do so because tonight we're going to blast your inner critic to smithereens. Hi, come in. <laughs> so we're going to talk about all those voices and various messages and conditionings that we've been that we've received that might hold us back from um, really um, being able to experience the Buddha's teachings in their fullest. So um, that's enough for me, and I would like to hand over to Ajahn Brahmali, who will start with a little bit of meditation. Would I? Okay, I guess yeah. I will. Okay. I think so. I, I, <laughs> so I, we'll have some meditation, we'll I, have a talk, and then we'll okay. have opportunity for questions at the end. Mm. Okay, excellent. Thank you. So it's nice to take orders, actually, because you can just relax <laughs> and just wait and just do whatever. So thank you so much for that. That's excellent. Uh, so uh, let's start, as we often do on these things, doing some medita meditation together. Is everyone okay with that? Uh, Anyone objects? Last chance? Okay, we're going to do meditation together. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so sit comfortably. Uh, remember, this is not a practice in self-torture or self-torment or anything like that. This is a practice in enjoyment. All about Buddhism, all about meditation in the suttas, in the word of the Buddha, is about enjoying, uh, not kind of hardship and uh, that sort of thing. So uh, sit back, uh, yeah, relax. Uh, and make sure that you start off by feeling the body uh, as we start out. Uh, the uh, process of meditation is a gradual process of letting go. Uh, and the very first letting go is actually the relaxation itself. Uh, because the, uh, the problem very often is that we control too much. Uh, and when you control, you get tense, you get all these issues that you can feel physically in the body. Coming, of course, originally from the mind and then kind of reverberating throughout your five khandhas, as we say in Buddhism, uh, including the body. Uh, so sit back, uh, be comfortable, be at ease. Uh, take a few deep breaths. Ooh. <laughs>
and uh, just be patient with yourself. Uh, just allow things, uh, the world, your life, everything to fade into the background uh, and just uh, not doing anything much really at all, except for waiting for things to fade away. Uh, the path of meditation, when done in the right way, is very delightful and beautiful and easy and relaxing uh, and all good things coming together. Uh, so make it nice, uh, make it enjoyable. Uh, just relax, just enjoy yourself. Uh, and allow the world, the business, everything here to fade away here. Just keep the meditation very simple. Uh, it is really just about allowing the mind and the body to be. Uh, just allowing yourself to go with the flow of things. Uh, especially at the beginning of the meditation, uh, allowing yourself to relax. Uh, it takes a kind of gentle attitude towards yourself and everyone else. Uh, and that gentleness towards yourself uh, allows you just to be here. Uh, without trying to be this way or that way, uh, and thereby letting go of whatever tensions uh, there may be, uh, and just relaxing accordingly. Uh.
and uh, just allow things to arise and pass away on the screen of your perceptions. Uh, nothing to hold on to, uh, nothing to resist within. Uh, and as you just allow things to rise and pass away, uh, this is how the mind becomes peaceful. Uh, there's no will involved, uh, just the awareness of the arising and then passing away afterwards. Uh, and then gradually, 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 uh, it's as if the mindfulness uh, doesn't cling to anything, uh, and then the peace arises within that mindfulness. Uh, the mindfulness ar allows the phenomena of the world is to gradually fade away into the background. Uh, this is the power of mindfulness. Uh, and this is why sitting for uh, periods of time, the longer you sit, the more peaceful you tend to become. Uh, so let's enjoy these few minutes we have together. Uh. And uh, the meditation, uh, to make it more powerful and interesting, uh, it's important to use just little things to develop that sense of delight and even joy in the meditation. Uh, and one thing to do is to have a sense of gratitude for being able to be here today, uh, having a sense of gratitude for being in the presence of these teachings of the Buddha, uh, and remind yourself that you have found your way to the greatest teachings from the greatest spiritual master in human history. Uh, what a remarkable thing it is to be a disciple of such a person. Uh, and here you are, given on a tray, these wonderful teachings. Uh, and this is what we're trying to practice here today. Uh, this, uh, uh, what we have been left over from this teacher 2,500 years ago. Uh,
Okay, so now just uh, take a minute at the end uh, just to review the meditation here tonight uh, and ask yourself what are the causes, what are the conditions uh, that make the meditation work, uh, especially ideas such as letting go uh, and building up the delight. Uh, what are these things? Uh, how do they come about? Uh, Okay, everyone, so that's the uh, end of the meditation for this evening, so please come out and just um, be comfortable. Uh, okay, so... Um, we are going to talk about the uh, inner critic. So, uh, see what happens? <laughs> Don't, uh, so we see how this goes. And so the idea here is, uh, of course, the, uh, the actual title for the talk, I think, is, what is it again? To, uh, how to accept the inner critic or how to be at peace, how to make peace, I think, with the inner critic was the title of the talk, yeah. And uh, straight away it occurs to me that when you have a title like Making Peace with Inner Critic, uh, it is only part of what we're trying to do. Uh, it's like the beginning, yeah, the beginning stage is then to make peace with Inner Critic, uh, but ideally we want to go beyond the Inner Critic, right? That's kind of the deeper aspect of this. Uh, and so hopefully we're going to uh, do this in stages, uh, and first of all, uh, move to understand how we can just be at ease with these things, uh, and then move on how to actually deal with it properly. So maybe it even disappears, uh, along with many other bad things uh, in human life. Uh, that's kind of what this uh, is uh, hopefully going to be about, and there will be plenty of time afterwards to ask some questions and things, uh, and we can then uh, uh, even expand out the discussion after that. Uh, so I think one of the kind of foundations for uh, uh, making peace with the inner critic uh, is to actually uh, also not judge other people. Uh, that is the very beginning of this. Uh, because I think the uh, human mind is such that if you judge, uh, yeah, then that judgments tend to kind of generalize to all people. Uh, and because you are one of all people, yeah, you can get included in that judgment. Uh, so by judging others, uh, you will also uh, eventually end up judging yourself. So the inner critic will criticize externally and then it will criti it criticize internally afterwards. Uh, uh, and this is just the nature of the human mind. Uh, and so the beginning is then to actually uh, start to see people in general uh, in a different way, uh, yeah, not criticizing others. Uh, uh, and then as you do that, as you start to understand people in a new way, with more compassion, uh, understanding how they're conditioned to be the way they are, etc., uh, etc., et you also start to become more at ease with yourself. Uh, because that is just how these things tend to work. Uh, yeah, This uh, idea, we tend to generalize, we can't exclude ourselves from criticism uh, uh, when we also criticize uh, others. Uh, and this does not mean that we don't have any preferences in life. This doesn't mean that we don't, you know, judge between people. It just means that if you see someone who may not have, uh, you know, good qualities or whatever, instead of judging people in a harsh way, you have an understanding for people. Yeah, you have a sense of concern for them, maybe even con con compassion for them, precisely because they have whatever good, bad qualities they might actually have. So it's not a, a lack of discrimination. We still discriminate. And the ability to discriminate is actually fundamental to the Buddhist path. Yeah, if you don't discriminate, how are you going to make any progress? One of the fundamental uh, aspects of uh, uh, the spiritual practice is the idea of Kalyanamitta. You know the word Kalyanamitta? Huh? Yeah, you know it? Okay, you know it. Huh? You, do you know it? Huh? Kal Kalyanamitta? Huh? Heard of, yeah, Kalyanamitta, okay, you know, okay, good, excellent. Huh? Kalyanamitta, if you don't know this word, it's a beautiful word in the Pali language. Uh, the idea of Kalyana really means beautiful, yeah, or delightful or something like that. Uh, and Mitta is friendship. Uh, 
So it literally means beautiful friendship. And the idea is, and of course, the uh, good friendship that you have on the spiritual practice. That's the idea of Kalyanamitta. The opposite of Kalyanamitta is Papamitta. Papamitta means bad friendship. Uh, yeah, don't go there, please. Uh, yeah, promise me not to go to Papamitta because that's kind of that's the, down, the down, downfall of the entire spiritual path. Uh, so, uh, but we have to make that distinction between the Kalyanamitta and the Papamitta. If we don't make that distinction, obviously, uh, we cannot hang out with the right kind of people. Yeah, and that's bad. If you don't hang out with the right kind of people, you're going to influence by bad people. Uh, and if you're influenced by bad people, you tend towards badness. Uh, is that true? Do you believe that? Or, do you, or are you one of those people who believes, I'm strong, uh, even when I hang out with bad people, uh, I'm so strong that I will make the bad people good people, uh, and so there's no problem. Uh, this, is an, this is a delusion, yeah? this is a kind of wrong idea how we think about the world. Uh, the reason why we think about the world in this way, that we can somehow withstand the forces around us that kind of condition us in a bad direction, uh, that is precisely the sense of self. The sense of self has this feeling that I am like this, and because I am like this, I will withstand these forces outside, and I will condition those other people to come here to Wolfson College and listen to Dhamma talks. Does anyone come here in this way? Because some, <laughs> someone brought you in in this way? I mean, this very rarely happens. And, the, uh, and so, once you understand this distinction, and you understand the idea of conditioning and how conditioning comes about, <laughs> you understand the importance of kalamitta, of good spiritual friendship. It is foundational for the entire spiritual path. And there are some very beautiful suttas. I, when I ever I give a Dhamma talk, I always talk about suttas. Yeah, you know suttas? The suttas are the word of the Buddha, often called the discourses of the Buddha. It's like one kind of discourse. He starts out, he, he was staying in Rajagaha in the Veluvan at the bamboo grove, and then he, he addresses the monks and says, monks, and the monk says, yes, sir, and then he speak, gives his talk, listen, monks, and they say, the monks say yes, and then he gives a talk. This is a kind of a sutta, and he goes to the very end, and at the very end the monks say, sadhu, sadhu, no, they say, what do they say? They rejoice. So they rejoice in whatever way, as I do, whatever it is that they said in those days. Uh, so, um, uh, so that is the, uh, the uh, this is the idea then, uh, yeah, of the, uh, the, the suttas uh, of the Buddha. And one of the suttas, they talk about the importance of Kalyanamitta. Uh, and it basically says that if you have Kalyanamittas, good spiritual friendship, uh, and this is called Sapurisa in this particular sutta. Sapurisa means like superior people, uh, yeah, superior people or good people or whatever you want to call them. Uh, if you have that, uh, this is interesting, right? If you have a Sapurisa as your friend, Sapurisa Sangseva, it means like hanging out with good people. That's kind of almost literally what it means. Sangseva means, okay, associate with. We don't want to get too slangy. Associate with or hanging out with good people. And that leads you, according to the Sutta, all the way to awakening. Yeah, it's like a stage by process. As long as you hang out with those Kalyanamitas, you will reach awakening. Yeah, and according to this, that's all you have to do. Yeah, hang out with the right people, live, and then of course, everything that happens on it, you hear the Dhamma, then when you hear the Dhamma, you get inspired to practice in the right way, you become even, I know you're kind already, you become even more kind, yeah? Is that right? You're kind already? Yeah, okay, good. I'm glad you're nodding your head up there. <laughs> that's good. It's good to have that kind of sense of self-worth, right? It's not, there's no need to kind of be, uh, be too kind of, uh, Humble. I mean, you should be humble, but not kind of humble in a silly kind of way. So you become good, and then you practice meditation. You practice what is called the seven factors of awakening, and you become fully awakened. And the cause of that is simply hanging out with good people. Do you believe that? Does it make sense to you? It makes sense, okay, good, I'm glad. Yeah, this is great, because for many people it doesn't make any sense. How can you just hang out with good people and then become enlightened? What about all the other stuff you have to do? But the point, of course, is that all the other stuff emerges out of that contact with good people. And it happens all more or less automatically. Why? Because we are conditioned. This is what conditioning means. Yeah, these things emerge kind of out, almost like, almost miraculously, except that we don't have miracles in Buddhism. But uh, apart from that, it's kind of miraculous. It's marvelous. I think it's a better word in Buddhism. Wonderful and marvelous are really the Buddhist equivalent of the Christian miracles. 
And uh, so this is the, uh, the idea of all of this uh, conditioning, yeah, hanging out with the saparis of the good people, uh, and then things kind of work based on that. Uh, and that is uh, uh, why these things are so, this is kind of really fundamental to this whole idea, also overcoming the, uh, the critic within and then taking the path further. Yeah. But um, so this is the beginning. Don't criticize other people, hang out with the right people, uh, learn from that also then eventually not to criticize yourself because we understand how people are conditioned. Yeah? And that conditioning is such that even awakening itself happens through this conditioning sequence. Uh, but um, I, this is just the beginning. Yeah? The next thing uh, to do, I think very important part of the Buddhist path, is what you might call self-acceptance. Uh, yeah, if you have a very powerful and deep sense of self-acceptance, uh, which, which can include self-worth, uh, self-valuing, all of these kind of things, uh, if you accept yourself for who you are, you're not going to have that inner critic uh, of yourself. Uh, yeah, I'm okay here. I'm fine. Okay, I make mistakes. Uh, but everyone makes mistakes. So, you know, I'm one of everyone, so of course I make mistakes. Uh, that's kind of the way things are here. Uh. And so you have this deep sense of understanding your own humanity here. Uh. Human beings are like this. Uh, human beings make mistakes. Uh, human beings are conditioned to be the way we are. Uh, why do you think uh, you were born as a human being? Uh, yeah, it is not random. It doesn't happen just because of, you know, it happens because of cause and conditions. Everything in Buddhism is about cause and conditions. Uh, and those cause and conditions uh, included certain flaws. And that's why you became a human. Uh, if you didn't have those flaws, you wouldn't be here. Uh, yeah, you'll be somewhere else, uh, far better place than here. Uh. <laughs> yeah, so it's because you have flaws that you are here. So maybe in one sense, you know, this is a, not a bad place to be. If you are among the in the human realm, you can kind of get to meet the Buddha. The Buddha was a human being. Yeah, if you weren't a human, more difficult to meet the Buddha. Yeah, so this is kind of one of the advantages of being a human being. Yeah, and so you see that of course I have these flaws. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't even be here in Wolfson College, in Oxford, in the UK, on planet Earth, in this universe, a galaxy or whatever. Yeah? This is where it comes from. It's based on these ideas. So you start to accept yourself for the flaws that you have as a person. And one of the kind of the underlying, again, ideas that make you accept yourself is to understand these ideas of causality. Yeah, you are who you are because of conditions, cause and conditions, not because of choices. Well, choices are part of it as well, but remember, choices themselves are conditioned. Yeah, so you are who you are here today because of the cause and conditions of the past. And if you are a product of the cause and conditions in the past, how can you be to blame for what you are, you know, for who you are? Why can you? Why should you have a? Why should you criticize yourself uh, if the person you are now is an outcome of all of these things in the past? Yeah, your habits, your things, maybe your past life, your upbringing, your parents, your teachers, your mates in school, or whatever it is. Yeah, all of these things uh, is actually what has made you the person you are today. Yeah? And so, how can you criticize yourself uh, if you do something bad? It's just the bad aspect of your conditioning coming out. Uh, and uh, so then you start to see yourself in a very different light, yeah? And you start to have that sense of idea of self-acceptance. Uh. And at this point, people will often ask, what about free will? Isn't there some free will here? Uh, I make a choice, you know, I do this, I don't do that, uh, or whatever. Uh. And uh, from a Buddhist point of view, uh, the idea of free will doesn't make any sense. Uh. How can there be free will? Uh? What is what would free will be anyway? Free will is a Christian idea. It exists in the within a theistic context. It makes good sense because okay, God creates human beings and He gives them free will so they can mess around and do stupid things. Yeah, that's kind of the, the Christian idea. And if you didn't have free will, that meant you you know you because you have to kind of look after yourself and make good and bad choices. So He wants to give you the opportunity to do many bad things. So He gives you free will for that. That's basically almost like what it is. If you're going to kind of be a, caricature of the idea of free will. Huh? But um, from a Buddhist point of view, huh, your will, huh, the choices that you make huh, are the outcome at the present moment huh, of all the con cause and conditions that work on you. Huh? And these cause and conditions are internal, huh? they are external, huh? they come from the past, huh? 
They don't come from the future, but they come from the present. And all of these things come together. When those things come together in a certain way, you make certain choices. And how could there be anything apart from those causes and conditions? Well, the only way there could be anything apart from those causes and conditions was if there was some kind of entity that stands apart from the rest of the world of causality, some kind of inherent thing yeah, that's, that kind of is not affected by cause and conditions. Things that in Christianity you might call a soul, in the ancient Indian religion you would call an Atman or something like that. Yeah, that thing is not affected by anything. It stands like a pillar, like a mountain peak. Yeah, this is kind of how it is explained in the sutta as a mountain peak, yeah, firm and solid, not shaken by the winds or anything like that. And that mountain peak, that is the idea of a self. And of course, if a self is independent of cause and conditions, then you can make maybe free will choices. But if there is no such self, if everything is just things coming together in the present, the past and the present coming together, then the idea of free will doesn't make any sense anymore. So in Buddhism, it's like a non-issue. Of course there is no free will. You must be joking, where do you get that idea from? Free will. You know, that's not what freedom is. And so the whole idea of free will does not, is not really kind of the, what's going on. It's expressed very beautifully in a sutta called the Anatalakana Sutta. So anyone here has heard about the Anatalakana Sutta? Huh? No? Not heard about it? Really? Okay, well you have some nice things coming up for you, so just... Uh, <laughs> Anatalakana Sutta? Huh? Yeah, some of you know the Anatalakana Sutta, a very famous sutta. It is according to tradition, it's the second sutta of the Buddha. Yeah, the very first sutta was the Dhamma Chakrapavattana Sutta, that is setting in motion the wheel of the Dhamma that he taught to the five ascetics after his awakening. Yeah. And after that he taught the Anatalakana Sutta, which means the characteristics of non-self. Yeah, and at the end of that sutta, five monks became fully awakened. Yeah, this doesn't happen so much these days, but in those days it was kind of really fabulous. Yeah, people becoming awakened. They're listening to a sutta that was very powerful, taking it on board based on having built up very strong spiritual qualities beforehand and then having the ability to understand things very profoundly. And in that Anatalakana Sutta, the Buddha basically says that you don't choose your choices. Yeah? You, you, if you say, you, you cannot say, may my choices be like this, may my choices not be like that. In other words, you have no will to, to enable you to influence your choices. Yeah? Your choices are kind of given. What are they given by? Well, they're given by the past and they're given by present input right now. These are the things that make you choose. And so this is the idea that there is no free will. Yeah? If your choices are given yeah, by cause and conditions, then there is no free will. And so this is, once you start to kind of get your head around that, and once you have even just a confidence in the Buddha that this must be true, yeah, how can you judge yourself? How can you have an inner critic that says that you are doing stupid things? If you are forced to do what you're doing, even though you may make a bad choice, yeah, it comes out of this conditioning process. And so this is, uh, for, you can actually see this uh, if you do some meditation practice and you observe yourself in the daily life, how you function as a person, you can start to see that this must indeed be true. Yeah, you can see how the causes from the past kind of, you know, kind of, kind of you know, push you in a certain direction. Yeah, and there's really very little you can do. It's kind of strange because it feels like we have a, choice, right? If I say to you, you know, do you want to drink a glass of water? It feels like, okay, I can choose either to have it or not. I'm just going to check it out now, see if I have choice. So, do I have choice or not? So it feels like I have choice, right? So, I don't even know right now whether I'm going to have a sip of water or not. I don't know. But uh, if I do, it is not because of choice, it's because suddenly all the conditions come together. Exciting. What's going, what are we going to do? Okay. That was a conditioned choice. <laughs> it's pretty much bound to happen. So, anyway. So, um, yeah, so this is how. So, the idea of a, uh, a, 
a self or the idea of choices that is not conditioned is kind of really doesn't make any sense from a Buddhist point of view huh? because that is all there is. There are things in nature within yourself or outside that kind of come together. The problem is it feels like we have a choice. Yeah, This is the problem. Huh? And this feeling of having a choice tends to override the insight that actually there is no uh, free will. Huh? And so be very careful with that sense inside that we have free choice. Huh? Because that is really the problem. This is why we make so much out of the idea of non-self in Buddhism. The idea of anatta, because that anatta idea is the one thing which eventually, when you see it very deeply, overcomes this feeling of free, uh, of free will, that you actually can do something with it. Uh, so be very careful with that sense of uh, uh, anatta. Yeah? Contemplate the idea of non-self. Uh, and as you do that, gradually it unravels this whole sense that we actually have free choice. Uh, it is important here to understand that free choice does, or, or the lack of free choice does not mean that everything is determined by the past. If everything was determined by the past, there would be no way out. We would be stuck in this wheel of samsara and this kind of moving forward forever. So that is not really the point. The point is that the past is a very important component in what makes us choose certain things right now. But there's also another important component, and that is the present. Yeah, and that is where the freedom actually can arise. Because in the present, you can use the teaching of the Buddha or some other wise, you know, skillful means or whatever it is to move those choices in the right direction. Yeah, and that is where the way out comes. So you read the word of the Buddha, and that reading of the word of the Buddha, together with all the past, together, this is where the choice becomes possible. And then the freedom of choice, or the, not, then, then the possibility of freedom arises through that. But actually, this idea of free will is very interesting. We were actually discussing this the other day as well, and I find it a very interesting point. And I, just for your benefit, I will kind of repeat some of the things I was saying the other day. Yeah. Because in Buddhism, we have a different idea of freedom of choice. Yeah. And that is the idea that uh, usually in life, our mind is very constrained. It is constrained by all kinds of things. But one of the things that it is constrained by is the things that we call defilements of the mind or hindrances in the mind. Yeah, these are things like desires and ill will and agitation and, you know, tiredness and whatever it might be. Yeah, these constrain the mind. And what it means when the mind is constrained like that, there are certain things it cannot do. Yeah, if I, just before we try to meditate, how peaceful did you become in that meditation? Did you become supremely peaceful or just a little bit peaceful? Probably just a little bit, right? 15 minutes is not enough to really make you super duper peaceful. Huh? And so the, and of course the reason for that is because you don't have that ability to just become peaceful very quickly. Huh? Why? Because your mind is constrained by those limitations that are inside of us, huh? which is the conditioning of the mind from the past. Huh? So the freedom of the mind in Buddhism is to remove those constraints. Huh? And if those constraints are removed and you sit down and you meditate, uh, yeah, you can go into meditation incredibly quickly. Uh, yeah, someone who is a very skilled meditator, they can go into very deep states, almost like at the snap of a finger, uh, and they are in a deep state of meditation. Uh, and that is because the constraints are there. So the problem with freedom in Buddhism uh, is not the freedom of will, but is the liberate in the mind from the constraints that stop us from accessing certain qualities, certain depths of the mind, certain insights that we can access without those constraints. So freedom means removing the constraints, and this is what the spiritual path is all about. When we talk about the Noble Eightfold Path, the Arya Tangika Magga, yeah, Arya, Noble, Eightfold Path, Atangika, Magga. When we talk about that, it basically is a path of removing the constraints of the mind that then allow the mind to achieve deep meditation and then insight as a consequence. Yeah, so this is, uh, I'm making a bit sidetracked now from the actual topic. This is usually what happens when, with this talk. So. <laughs> And so that is the first part of this, right? The first part of having self-acceptance. Because we are okay the way we are. Yeah, there's no choice. We have cause to be who we are. So how can we not be okay the way we are? So accept yourself for what you are. Okay, you make a mistake. It's all right. Yeah, it's not a problem. And by thinking about such things again and again and again over time, gradually you recondition the mind. 
I recognize that many people have a very heavy conditioning, maybe from childhood, maybe the parents told them off too often and said, you know, ah, you shouldn't be doing that, you're hurting others, or, you know, don't do that. And maybe the, our parents didn't have enough compassion for us. Actually, almost very likely they didn't have enough compassion for us, right? Our parents were not arahants, they were not awakened beings. Of course, they had their own limitations. And so we need to have compassion for them as well. But, you know, uh, yeah, so of course we are going to be a little bit messed up, yeah, from our parents. Uh, it's not their fault, uh, but it's, anyway, that's the way it is. Uh, I'm not going to ask how many people were messed up by their parents because I don't. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> then what we want to do is to take this one step further. Uh, yeah, so first of all is the idea of self acceptance. Uh, and the second thing, which is even more profound in many ways, uh, is the idea of self compassion. Uh, yeah, because if you are trapped by the past, by your habits, by past lives, by all of these things, not only do you need to, do you have to accept yourself for who you are because you are kind of trapped by that conditioning, but a lot of that conditioning is bad. A lot of that conditioning causes hurt. A lot of that conditioning is painful. Yeah. And so you actually are trapped and the person who is trapped, what do they deserve? They deserve compassion. Yeah, so once you start to understand that this is not just kind of a, uh, a, you know, you don't have free will, but actually it is a painful trap that you are in, uh, you can have self-compassion for yourself. Uh, and this is said uh, by many psychologists to be one of those most beautiful qualities we can have towards ourselves, uh, the idea of self-compassion. Because when you have self-compassion, this whole idea of forgiving yourself, of letting go, of not criticizing yourself, uh, becomes second nature. Uh, yeah, because you understand that actually life is difficult. Life is always going to be painful. Life always has all of these downsides. And you are part of that life. You are also trapped in these things. Yeah, this is just the nature of things. And then you start to see yourself in a completely different light as a consequence. How often people tend to be proud of their personality. Yeah, this personality, I have built it up over a long life, yeah, trying to do the right thing, studying hard, uh, um, <laughs> whatever it is that you have done yeah, in your life, uh, and you're kind of proud of yourself because you've done this. But your personality is not a trap. Yeah, it's not kind of, this is what, the way I like to think about the idea of personality. Once you start to think of personality as a trap, uh, why? Why is it a trap? Because it limits you. Huh? This is your personality. It means you can't step out of it. Uh, yeah? That personality includes bad qualities and uh, some good qualities, hopefully, but, it has, but it's still a limitation. And so personality is actually a trap. Huh? So don't be proud of your personality. Huh? It is just a conditioned phenomenon that has occurred and been developed over a long period of time and now you are who you are or you, you're not even who you are because you're just kind of this thing moving on but you know you have certain qualities or whatever. And so you are trapped by that personality. That personality comes from the past through cause and conditions yeah, and then kind of moves you into the future. So think about these things in a different way. And then when you are not so proud of that personality it is easy to let, to let go of that personality. And when it's easy to let go of the personality, your meditation deepens. Uh, because personality gets in the way of meditation. Uh, yeah, in meditation you will, you will start uh, uh, justifying yourself, yeah, or, you, or all these kind of things. Uh, and then you can start to deepen the meditation as a consequence. Uh. The Buddha has a beautiful simile about the idea of compassion. Uh, yeah. You know that simile? No, no one is nodding here. Okay, good. That means I can say something maybe you haven't heard before, if you don't know about it. It's always good to test the audience. But some of you have heard it before, because some of you have been to my retreats and things. You know everything I've ever taught, and I can't say anything new, because I <laughs> you've heard everything already. That's okay. We need to hear the same thing many, many, many times. I know in myself how utterly stupid a human being can be. I know it from first-hand experience, yeah, personal experience, very direct. Uh, and how long it takes to recondition in the mind. That's what I mean by stupidity. Uh, yeah, I don't mean kind of lack of uh, uh, academic knowledge or whatever. Just this sticky, sticky, sticky mind. It takes a long time to come around. Uh, and uh, so I need to hear the suttas again and again and again. So when I'm telling you this story, I'm really just telling myself. That's kind of what I'm actually doing here. I'm reminding myself. So thank you for being my audience so that I can tell myself again one more time. Otherwise, I might not be, have the opportunity to do this. So I'm very, very thank you so much. So uh, I, 
anyway, you know. <laughs> so uh, this uh, particular simile of the Buddha, of the person, of why compassion is so important. Uh, and the Buddha says the idea of compassion yeah, is like, um, we should have compassion when someone has lots of bad qualities. And the Buddha says, if you see, it's like when you see someone walking on a desert road, yeah, and this person walking on a desert road, they are sick, they are ill, yeah, and there is nobody there. There's no food, there's no water, there's no people, there's no doctor, there's no nurse, there is no village, there's nothing. And this person is sick walking on a desert road. <laughs> And um, then, as a person walks on desert road, what is your attitude towards this person? You're just kind of staying from afar. There's nothing you can really do directly yourself. Yeah, you can't really intervene because you're looking from afar. But you're seeing this person walk on a desert road. And what happens, of course, if you see a sick person walking in a desert, someone who has no support, someone who has nobody to look after them, you tend to feel compassion. Right? You tend to have sympathy for this person. Because it is terrible to be sick and have no support in the world. You know, it's like if you visit someone in the hospital because they're sick. What do you do? Do you go and tell them off for getting sick? <laughs> you don't, right? Because people are not usually responsible. Sickness is what happens to this body. Of course, we take certain precautions, but generally speaking, sickness is what happens when you have a human body. This is the downside of having a human body. This was a mistake you made when you became a human. Why did you become a human? That was, that was a mistake. Yeah? Sickness, once you are human, guaranteed you're going to be sick. This is no, not some kind of aberration. This is absolutely guaranteed. Uh, yeah? This is part of the course. Uh, and so whenever, next time you go to the doctor, please say to the doctor, uh, something is right with me, doctor. I'm sick again today. That's what you should. <laughs> that is the right kind of attitude to have. Uh. And so um, you see this person walking on the road, uh, and they are sick. And all you can feel is compassion and sympathy for that person. Because you know, if they don't find someone to help them out, then they're going to be heading towards their own demise. It's going to be the end of them, basically. Because there is nothing there to support them. And so the Buddha then says, it is exactly the same thing with people in the world. When you see people in the world, you see people having bad qualities, you see you, maybe your own bad qualities, because you have bad qualities. Yeah, everyone has some bad qualities, as I was saying before. That doesn't mean you should criticize yourself, but you've got some bad qualities. Yeah, and the answer then is not to judge yourself, not to be harsh on yourself, not to criticize yourself, but to have compassion for yourself, just like that person walking on the desert road, says the Buddha. Why? Because someone, if they have a lots and lots of bad qualities, actually we're talking about the really bad scallywags now, they're kind of really dodgy characters. Yeah, we're not talking about uh, kind of ordinary people. Yeah, if someone has really, really bad qualities like this, uh, yeah, they are going towards a very bad future uh, as a consequence, uh, just like the person who is ill, who is sick, uh, walking on that desert road. Uh. So the idea is, uh, yeah, if someone has bad qualities, especially those people who have really, really bad qualities, yeah, like you can imagine the maybe the Adolf Hitlers of the world, or the you know the, the Stalins, or, or whatever. Who you know? I don't know who you who is your favorite buddy buddy, but whatever, whoever that is, yeah, especially those people, yeah, they are, are really in trouble. Huh? Yeah, or if you feel upset about the wars happening in the world, yeah, same thing again. You know, there are perpetrators there and there are victims. But remember that all of these people, yeah, the right attitude, says the Buddha, is to have compassion. Yeah, are you able to have compassion for all those people that you may, may not really, you know, you may not find yourself kind of in, reacting to in a negative way <laughs> initially when you hear about them? Compassion for those people, that is the right attitude. So uh, when we understand uh, that people, everyone is trapped, uh, everyone is a product of the cause and conditions in the past, how can you not have compassion for them? Uh, and when you have compassion for others in this way, you also have compassion for yourself because you realize you yourself are trapped. Uh, sometimes it can be very hard to see in the present because in the present it really feels like you have a choice to drink that water or not. That's what it feels like right now. But sometimes when you look at the past and you look at the person you were maybe 30 years ago, yeah, or whatever it is, 
40 years ago. It shows you how old I'm getting now. Am I really that old? I guess I must be. Okay. So, <laughs> so when you look in the past, often it's much easier to see the cause and the conditions. Now it feels like you're making a choice. Yeah? When I decided to become a monk, it felt like, yeah, I'm making my choice. My parents say they don't want me to become a monk. I don't care what my parents say. I'm going to become a monk regardless. It felt like a very kind of strong choice. Yeah? No bargaining can be had with me at that time. It's just going to be a monk regardless of what the whole world says. If the whole world says no, I'm going to say yes. So that's kind of the idea. Yeah? And it, but... Actually, if I'm going to be perfectly honest, and I look back on that period, I've been a monk for almost 30 years now, I look back on that period, the further back in time, the more it seems to me as if things happened because I was just steered in that direction. Yeah, I look back, I can kind of see the various elements of my life falling into place, and it's almost as if I didn't have any choice to but to become a monk. Of course I became a monk. It kind of looks like it was kind of that's what was going to happen. But at the time, it felt like a real choice. And so this is one of the ways of kind of seeing yourself, yeah? getting that perspective of time late, of, of a later period of time in your life, getting the perspective that enables you to see the causality at work. Yeah? And then you can start to have compassion for yourself, self-compassion for being trapped in these habits that you have, how hard it is to get out of our bad habits. Yes, it's hard, right? It's really difficult. And very often we expect, this is actually one of the, first, one of the really important learning points, I think, in this as well, is that sometimes we expect to change other people. We want other people to change. Yeah, I mean, very commonly it's kind of husband and wife, they want to change each other. Yeah, be like this, don't be like that. Yeah, very, very common. And it's not, it happens, of course, between all people, not just husband and wife, it happens between everyone. But we should never demand anyone else to change when we know how difficult it is to change ourselves. Yeah, it is really difficult to change. And so it starts with self-compassion. When you have self-compassion, it opens up the possibility of change inside of you. Why? Because self-compassion has a positive state of mind that enables you to inquire into those causes and to be honest about what is going on. If you don't have self-compassion, how can you be honest about yourself? It's too painful to accept that you have these negative things, qualities. But if you have self-compassion, you have the ability, you have the positive mind state that enables you to inquire properly. And then change becomes possible because of that. Gradually, gradually, gradually. Huh? And then you turn yourself in a different direction. Huh? And so these are some of the most powerful ways of uh, letting go yeah, of that critic. Yeah? Stage by stage by stage. Uh, starting to appreciate yourself. Uh, and of course, as you do this and as you're practicing the Noble Edful Path, uh, as you're doing your best to live with kindness and understanding, uh, you also start to appreciate the good qualities in yourself. Uh, everyone who is here is a good person. Uh, I'm going to prove it to you. Uh, is any bad person here? Uh, ha! Proven. Yeah, I told you that everyone here is a good person. Yeah, this works every time. Yeah, there's no... <laughs> so... Yeah, but it's true though, isn't it? Because why do people come to a place like this? It's not because they are evil. Why would anyone come to this kind of talk if they were evil or bad or terrible or wanting to you know, do bad things? Anyone who comes to this sort of thing is going to have some kind of good inclination. Otherwise, you wouldn't bother coming to this kind of thing. And so everyone here is worthy of respect for at least trying, having the right kind of intention. Yeah. And then you can start to appreciate yourself as well, because you too have the right intention. But very often the habits of the past override those good intentions and makes it impossible for you to live them out properly in your life. And so that is kind of how we learn to appreciate our good sides as well. Actually, I'm trying for goodness sake. Isn't that wonderful? I meditate a bit. I try to be kind. I try to be generous. Some very kind lady, drove us here today. She came all the way out to the monastery, picked us up in a car and drove us all the way here. What a wonderful thing that is. Yeah, otherwise we have to walk. <laughs> so I'm very happy that she came. It was very kind to come, come all that way because otherwise we have a big problem. So it was, very, it was wonderful. But that is kindness in action. And sometimes we don't appreciate our good signs enough. We start to appreciate those good qualities. Actually, I'm doing all of these things. 
What a wonderful thing that is, that I'm doing these things. Uh, and then, uh, as you then develop those good qualities inside of yourself, uh, you come back here to Wolfson College. Uh, yeah, I was here last time, here, here again now. And every time, every year, or as you go on retreats, or whatever it is that you do, uh, you start to meditate a little bit. Uh, yeah, and you find your meditation is more peaceful. Uh, yeah, it is more reliable. Uh, you actually start to enjoy it more. Uh, what a wonderful thing that is when that happens. Uh, and what you start to see is that when the mind becomes more peaceful, uh, you also get a better understanding of the thinking mind. Uh, yeah, and one of the things that you start to see here, when you start to see the thinking mind properly here, is the kind of alien nature of your thoughts. You start to feel, you start to see the thoughts in perspective, as if from a distance, as if you are observing a tree in the forest. Yeah, you're observing this thought, as if you're observing or listening to the wind in the trees. Yeah, and when you see the thoughts in that way, as wind in the trees or as whatever, it's almost as if they're not yours anymore. They come and go according to nature, according to cause and conditions. And then when that critic comes back and you see it comes, arises in your mind through these cause and conditions as the wind in the trees, you can't take it seriously anymore. How can you take this caused phenomenon being your thinking mind. How can you take that seriously? How can you take it as real? How can you take it as having any kind of uh, uh, relation to the reality of who you are as a person? It doesn't have any relationship. It's just this phenomenon that comes into the mind. The reason we take it seriously is because we believe that thought. That thought actually matters. Oh, that's true, isn't it? It's not true at all. Is there something arising from the past, uh, coming from these bad habits that we had, maybe from childhood, or whatever else it might be? Uh, and this is a beautiful thing when you see that in a meditation practice, uh, because it means that you no longer buy into the thinking mind uh, in the same way that you used to before. Uh, and of course, the moment you start not to buy into the thinking mind so much, uh, you become peaceful very, very quickly. Uh, if these thoughts are not yours, if these thoughts don't really matter, if they don't reflect the reality outside, rather they reflect just your conditioning, then don't take them so seriously anymore. They don't really matter. They are irrelevant. The peace and meditation, that is what really matters. And then you are really overcoming the critic. Yeah, This is where we're coming to the elimination stage. First of all, the acceptance, and then the kind of self-compassion, this kind of bit more of acceptance. And now we're coming to the elimination phrase. And then as you then deepen that meditation, yeah, and this is one of the beautiful things that I always like to say about meditation practice, the way it is described in the suttas of the Buddha, it is described so beautifully, so incredibly powerfully. Yeah? Yeah, one of the ways that is described is described as a uh, the psychological experience of meditation. In other words, how it what it feels like, uh, and what does meditation feel like? Uh? Okay, are you ready for this? Uh, hold on to your seats. Uh. <laughs> right. So the way that we describe this, he says that first of all, we start off with sila. Sila is the kindness, the goodness of the heart, yeah, the morality or whatever. From that comes the non-regret. You know you're living well, you don't regret it so much. The, crit the internal critic is already dying down. From the non-regret comes pamuja. Pamuja is gladness. From the gladness, from the pamuja comes the piti. Piti is like rapture, the energy in the body and the mind. From that rapture, as you develop the meditation more, comes the tranquility, pasaddi in the Pali language. From pasaddi comes sukha. Sukha is bliss. From the bliss comes the samadhi. The samadhi is the deep meditation that we're all ultimately hoping to attain without hoping, but kind of is part and parcel of this practice. And from that comes the insight into the nature of reality. Yeah, listen to that sequence. Yeah, listen to those factors. Yeah, joy, rapture, tranquility, bliss, stillness. Yeah, samadhi is the stillness of the mind. Then seeing things according to reality. Everything on that path is just so uplifting, so delightful, so worthy of, of spending your time doing. What else are you going to do with your life? Yeah, except this. This is probably the only thing worth doing. <laughs> And not falling down the stairs, also a good idea, uh, if we're... <laughs> so, 
Yeah, so this is what we have. This is actually what comes out of all of these things ultimately. And then when you do practice in this way, yeah, yeah, when you live in this way, you have these other consequences that comes out of your meditation. That is what you start to identify with. This becomes the new you. You change it. You identify with the beauty of the bliss inside, with the metta, the kindness that you have, with the compassion, all of these qualities. And then you identify away from the inner critic. When you have real compassion and metta for the world, how can you criticize anyone, including yourself? And ultimately, everything goes when you then have those deep insights way, way, way down the path. So, um, anyway, so those are <laughs> just a few words of uh, encouragement for all of you regarding the inner critic, yeah. or actually not regarding that, over regarding overcoming the inner critic, yeah, yeah, and being at ease with the inner critic. Not too at ease, because you want to make sure you overcome it, uh, but uh, at least not judging yourself. Uh. So, uh, that is my little talk for this evening. Now is a good time to say sadhu three times. Uh. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. I, I have to teach you this thing because people in the West don't know about this, yeah? so I have to kind of get this going. So that's good. So um, now I would like you to open up for uh, questions and comments and etc. Uh, etc. Et so please feel free to fire away and uh, you're very welcome to ask any questions you like uh, about any kind of topic. Yeah? as long as you're polite, <laughs> and uh, then uh, see what happens there. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, I actually had two questions, yeah. uh, but both of them are a bit lengthy, so I'll start with my first one. If there's time, maybe you'll come back to me. Um, ooh. <laughs> okay, so the first question was, in the beginning of the talk, you had uh, started talking about the relationships with people and how um, the uh, whether you were spending time with good people versus bad people, how that would affect basically the course of your life. And I was wondering, um, because you had also spoken about the fact that uh, the way that you free yourself from your inner critic is by first being non-judgmental towards other people. So my question is, um, isn't the concept of a bad person and a good person effectively a judgment because of the fact that you couldn't innately know that someone is a bad person? Because whether or not you believe that all people are born innately good people or not, someone's choices that may to you be bad may not be bad to someone else, although of course there are innate evils. And my subsequent question... Can, can, I, start, that, can I start with that one? I'm going to forget yes, what yes, you're yes, saying. Otherwise, yes. okay, okay. Okay. <laughs> let me start with that one here. So, uh, the, uh, yes, the um, idea is, yes, there is... Uh, there is judgment. We have to judge, uh, but we have to judge in the right way. That's kind of the issue. Uh, yeah? And if you judge in a way whereby you are critical, like condemning someone and saying they are bad and saying they are terrible or whatever, uh, that is where it goes wrong. The inner critic of yourself is when you feel bad about yourself. Yeah? That's kind of the idea. But that doesn't mean you can't judge. You can still judge and say this was a good thought, this was a bad thought, uh, but you are accepting of it because you know it is a conditioned process. That's kind of the whole idea of the conditioned process. So we need to judge, but we need to judge in the right way. That is the critical thing here. Yeah? And if you judge in the wrong way, then, then you have a problem here. Yeah? Regarding the idea, I just want to briefly comment on the, one of the other points that you made, the idea that uh, is everyone innately good? Yeah? And uh, from a Buddhist point of view, not really. Everyone has good potential, but not everyone is not innately good because there is no innate. The idea of innate doesn't actually exist in Buddhism because that would be a kind of self, that would be an existing entity within you. So there is no innate. So in Buddhism we would say you are what you are right now. So what are you now? Okay, now, I don't know, I'm just, you know, whatever it is that you are now, that is what you are now. And then maybe at some other time, maybe you are upset about something, okay, then you have a bad quality in your mind. Another day you feel you wake up in the morning, you love the whole world, yeah, okay, love world. that's a good quality in the mind. So you are what you are in that moment, yeah, that is what you are. So there is no innate good or bad, it's just changeability. That would be the Buddhist point of view. Huh? 
So, uh, if, are you happy with that? Does that make sense? I am, yeah? but yeah? I just have one little Please? thing off of that same question um, about um, is the concept of being a good person versus a bad person, especially when you're looking at other people, so when you're making a judgment whether these are good people to hang out with, for, by example, of what you were talking about earlier or not, is the idea of bad and good in other people and things that you do and choices that you make, is it so black and white? Um, how does it fit in with the concept of stillness? Is it within that stillness that that black and white exists? Yeah, it is not black and white. It's gray scale all the way here. Yeah, <laughs> and so absolutely gray. But uh, the uh, idea is that uh, you can tell whether people are good qualities or not uh, by observing them. Uh, and this is that observation is what matters. Uh, and so, for example, the reason how the Buddha started the, uh, you know, Buddhism in the world or, or his teaching career it wasn't really called Buddhism in those days, obviously, uh, was because people got faith in him because they looked at him and said, wow, what happened to you? Huh? Yeah. Gee, you kind of, you're, you're different. You have no anger. You have no greed. You just want to sit peaceful in a cave all day with your legs crossed doing nothing. You don't want to talk to anyone. You know, what, what's going on? What's the story? You seem to have endless kindness. And so we can judge people based on the external qualities in this way here. Yeah. To some extent. Not fully, but to some extent. And that is the basis upon which we decide whether someone is worthy of respect or not. Whether someone is worthy of being a Kalyanamitta, your spiritual friend. Yeah. We observe them in this way here. And uh, so you have, uh, you know, the more you read the suttas, the more you understand who the Buddha is, uh, you either gain that confidence or you don't, uh, depending on your pro proclivities. And most people, a lot of people who read the stories or suttas of the Buddha will tend to move in that direction. Wow, this person is actually quite amazing. Uh, how can anyone teach like that? Uh, how can anyone, you know, have this kind of attitude, etc., that you find in the suttas? Uh, and then you use that same idea also in, you know, with respect to living people as well and everyone else. So it, you're right, there is no black and white, but there is still the possibility of judging relatively. Yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you very much. Very good, you're welcome. Okay, you don't look Sri Lankan, but you're speaking Sri Lankan. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so I just want to know the difference between justification and self compassion, please. Justification and self compassion? Yes. The difference between the two? Yes, please. Uh, so when you justify your yeah. actions okay. and when you justify them. Right, okay, I see what you mean. And yeah. when okay. you have a self compassion. Yeah. Okay, thanks. What's the difference, please? What's the difference between the two? Okay. Thank you. So the difference is that um, you, with justification, usually means that you kind of, it's a bit dodgy justifying things, right? That's kind of usually what it means. Uh, so this is like a right kind of justification, self compassion here. Uh, you understand you did things because of cause and condition. That's a kind of justification, but it doesn't have the negative implications that the kind of justification you are talking about has. Uh, you justify yourself means that really I shouldn't have done it, but you still justify it somehow. It's a, it's a kind of, uh, it's the wrong way of coming to an acceptance of what you have done. Uh, but so in the Buddhist idea is more like understanding that, okay, this, I shouldn't have done this. Uh, yeah, and if you understand, you shouldn't have done it, but I didn't have much choice because the conditioning was so strong. Yeah. That's different from justifying. Justifying it means saying basically that uh, uh, it's okay what I did. That's kind of usually what justification means. Uh, yeah, but in this case, you're not saying it's okay. You know it is wrong, uh, but it arises because of cause and conditions. Because the cause and conditions are so powerful, I don't have much choice but to sometimes do bad things. Uh, yeah, this is kind of the nature of the human mind. Sometimes I will have angry thoughts. Uh, and I can't do much about that because the, the, uh, the um, uh, conditioning is so strong from the past. Uh. Sometimes that can become justification, that's what I was thinking. Sometimes it can become justification, so you have to do your best not to, not to make it justification. Yeah? And you will be able to do that, you have to make that choice. And, and I, think one of the, I think one of the important points, uh, maybe I didn't stress enough as well, is that uh, 
when we do self-acceptance and self-compassion, it should not be that we stop progressing on the path. That is kind of one of the dangers. Okay, I accept everything, and so I no need to actually practice or whatever. So you should still make that. That's, a, that's why that judgment is still very important, that we understand what is good and bad. So you recognize that right now I'm not able to overcome these bad qualities because of the conditioning from the past, but I will try because I know that they're harmful both for myself and for others. So I will try to do something about it for the future. But uh, our habits have a very powerful momentum. I've always liked the idea of the super tanker, you know, the enormous ships on the ocean that weigh half a million tons or whatever. And it's amazing the speeds, they can apparently get up to 20 knots or whatever. Imagine 20 knots, half a million tons, yeah? What that means, incredible momentum, speed times times mass is kind of momentum, right? Uh, kind of basic uh, physics, I think. I'm not sure anyway. It's something like that. Speed and mass is momentum. So you have this very powerful momentum and it takes a long, long, long time to turn that ship around. Kilometers, yeah? Tens of kilometers. Uh. And our minds are like that. Our minds are super tankers, uh, kind of. Uh, and so we kind of have this incredible momentum. So how can you expect yourself to turn around straight away here? Yeah? You can't. You have to give yourself time. You have to recondition yourself. And this is the idea. So in the meantime, you are trapped by that momentum. That momentum kind of makes you do things that you don't really want to do. And then gradually turn it around. Gradually, gradually, gradually. It's a reconditioning that you're doing. Yeah? That's kind of the idea here. Thank you so much. It's a great analogy. Yeah. Okay. Hi, can you hear me? Um, I also have two questions, if that's okay. Yeah, please, yeah. Um, yeah. The first, I wanted to follow up on what you just said about momentum and reconditioning and choice. You, you, you seem to suggest that we don't have choice, but reconditioning is, mm. I mean, if there's no choice, mm. there can be no reconditioning. I choose to listen to you. I yeah. choose to come here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I choose to read yeah. Yeah. and educate myself. And with that, my yeah. experience has been Sure. that change happens, yeah. but it is because I choose to read a particular sure. book or yeah. a scripture. Okay. So that's my first one. Okay, so let's, let's start there. Let's start there. Okay, let's start. Because this is always comes up. Yeah, this is the issue that always comes up. Because once you start, say there's no free will, these are the kind of things that come up straight away. So, and thank you for bringing it up, by the way. And so the idea, yes, there is choice. I'm not saying that there isn't choice. What I'm saying is that the choice is conditioned here. Yeah? Yeah, so you came here because of certain conditions. I don't know, you saw the poster, you got an email saying, please, you know, come here or, or remain ignorant forever or whatever. <laughs> so there was a conditioning there that made you come here today. And that is kind of the idea. So choices, it's not that there aren't choices. And choices are very, very important. It matters what we do. Huh? The point is that the choices themselves come from other causes and they're conditioned uh, in, in return. Huh? And that... And so the idea here, uh, what, mat what happens then once you, if you accept that insight, uh, and I are, would argue that is actually one of the most important insights of the Buddha, it then means that you ensure, you understand that conditioning is so powerful, you ensure that you get really good conditioning. Uh, that is one of the outcomes of that insight, uh, if you believe it, if you accept it. Uh, and so then you do things that actually ensures that your conditioning is such that your choices in the future will be better. Uh, that's, okay, thank you. Mm. Um, leads nicely on to the second question, conditioning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, um, from what, what, I, what I took from what you said uh, is that um, the you know, conditioning is, let's take the example of how I'm brought up by my parents. Yeah. As, as, as an example of my conditioning, of course, there's lots of other aspects to conditioning. What about the things where I am medically a particular way? And I'll give you a real example. Yeah. I was diagnosed two years ago as having ADHD. Yeah. So when we're doing our meditation, yeah. I'm struggling sometimes yeah. with my brain is doing all sorts of things. Sometimes I'm falling asleep as pretty much happened earlier. Mm. And that's part of my, that's not a conditioning thing. That is a medical condition. Mm. That wasn't something that was brought on me. I know there's some, maybe some people would disagree with that in ADHD terms, but there are other medical conditions, right? Which are medical <laughs> conditions. There are things that happen in the brain, which maybe are genetically caused. <laughs> That's nothing to do with conditioning, <laughs> but they have a consequence then <laughs> in terms of how I'm able or <laughs> not able to live. <laughs> what is the Buddhist view on that 
<laughs> yeah. Well, it is, it is conditioning. I mean, it, it, uh, it is conditioning in the sense that it is a condition, as you say, it affects you, right? I mean, you just said that yourself. It does affect you. So in that sense, it is conditioning here. Yeah. yeah? So it, your ability to meditate, your ability to do whatever will be, have some, there will be some effect from that, uh, uh, you know, the, the state you're in or the, the medical condition you have or whatever. So it is conditioning and it is itself also conditioned in a certain way. It is not easy to remove that condition. I mean, that's what you mean. You can't just remove it. Maybe that's kind of what you're alluding to there. But it comes from something, from genetics, from the environment, for whatever. It is not random that someone has ADHD. I mean, it comes from something. here. But it's difficult to remove. But it may not be impossible to remove it. It may not be impossible at least to ameliorate it to some extent, yeah? Or, or most medical conditions have a certain element of, uh, you know, we can do something about it. Uh, so, for example, from a Buddhist point of view, you might say that if you have a very bad mental qualities, like a lot of anger, it might make disease more likely, uh, yeah, because of that. Uh, in other words, the effect of the mind on the body is real. We know that from the placebo effect and many other things, uh, that there is a connection between mind and body in this way. Uh, and so it is not entirely uh, unconditioned, yeah, and so I would say that, uh, you know, do your best, uh, yeah, on the noble level path, practice, okay, you have this problem that's going to make things more difficult, maybe, in, at least in certain ways. Uh, but you can do most of the other things on the path, like just like everyone else. You can still be kind, yeah. You can be generous. You can kind of have the idea of at least inclining your mind to thinking in the right way, and all of these kind of things. And all of that is accessible to you, even though you have this this particular conditioning. There's still many many things you can do, even though there may be certain hurdles that you have that other people don't have. Uh, and uh, yeah, do you want to come back on that? You're very welcome to come back on it if you, uh, yeah. Well, I won't come back on it in terms of disagree with you because I now I mean I think yeah. it makes sense. Yeah. I think uh, the challenge that I that I that I, certainly I have in this is that, but your um, the, the self compassion and the self acceptance and self compassion, I personally find particularly difficult when it's something where I don't feel I have a. Um, hmm. I, I can look if I look back at. at past history and I can see things that have conditioned and have conditioned me, yeah. I can I can go, okay, that wasn't that I didn't choose to go and have that experience. That was imposed on me, therefore. Okay. So that I, I find that easier to have to be self accepting of and have compassion for myself about. Mm, mm. Things which are medical conditions I find much, much harder. I don't know I'm quite sure why that why that is. Yeah. Um, just just sharing it. I find it much, yeah. much harder to have um, to accept it, because okay. it feels like there's nothing I can do about it. I guess that's a Western way of thinking, maybe, I don't know. Right, but, but, but I think in a way that should be a basis for even more compassion, right? The fact that you can't do anything about it. And this is what I can, this is very much the Buddhist idea of the world. Yeah? You look at people around you and you realize that our societies are such, we are always causing suffering for each other. And very often there's nothing we can do about it. Look at the war, the wars around the world, right? Why are these war, wars happening? And I think it's just human nature that we have to have wars. This is what we do. We war. Yeah, we, we fight each other. We do crazy things. And if this peace has been lasted for too, too long, we just create more wars because this is kind of how we, how human existence is like. Yeah, there is no such thing as a state of human existence without war. And so after a while, you kind of see how we always oppress each other, always have this, you know, these things. And so suffering is always there. It's always part of life. Uh, yeah, the same thing with your medical condition, the same thing with everything in our, in our life, really. And then you can start to have compassion for everybody because we're all trapped in this way, in this realm, which is inherently violent, inherently problematic, uh, inherently has all these qualities to it. Uh. May, may, I, may I say one last thing? Is that okay? <laughs> and then I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> It's a, it was interesting, the yeah. comment the lady said over there, the question around um, who you spend time with, from, from something you said. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. talk to a lot of people who who are in my ADHD community, and they hate themselves uh -huh. because people don't want to spend time with them. Okay. So when I hear, and forgive me, I get upset, yeah. when I hear people say, you, when I hear you talk about who you spend your time with, yeah. People spend time with good people. A lot of ADHD people feel really judged, mm, mm. and that because people don't want to spend time with them, mm. it's very hard to, to then ref, um, yeah. 
to not hate yourself. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's very unfortunate, isn't it? It's very kind of I can see how that is very unpleasant and very difficult. Uh, yeah. So uh, I just you know you have to just come back to the idea that it's not it's not really your fault. Yeah. And so if other people judge you, actually it's their problem. They are the ones who have the problem, not you. And so you need to kind of try to change the perception. And this is kind of what I do. If someone abuses me, sometimes you get abused as a monk. Yeah, if people shout after you, you know, you, know, you, you bludger or whatever the kind of people say to you. And I think, well, listen, you know, you, you are the one who has the problem. Yeah, you, don't, you, you haven't really inquired, you don't understand what's going on. And so any, to me, any person who abuses or whatever, they are the person who has the problem. We don't have to worry. If you met an enlightened person or someone who was practicing really well on the path, they would never judge you in that way. They will always have compassion and kindness for you. So whose judgment is important? Is it the judgment of this ordinary person who doesn't know what they're talking about? Or is the person of someone who really has developed their mind a long way? That is the person's judgment you should worry about, yeah? And they will never judge you harshly. Yeah? And so forget about these other people. Yeah? It's irrelevant what they think. Yeah? They don't know what they're talking about. Yeah? And so instead, hang out with those people who do want to be your friends. Yeah? And you know, use, these days also you have the great ability to use the internet for, you know, in a positive way to kind of hang out with people anywhere around the world. And this is kind of one of the great things about modern technology, the ability to spread the Dhamma in, in this particular way. Yeah? So you is the best of what you have, uh, and I, I understand. I feel really sorry to hear that. It's kind of terrible. It's, it's kind of heart wrenching to hear, actually. Uh, to be honest with you, uh, so uh, try to kind of think a little bit like I'm suggesting, uh, and then hope maybe you can reduce the problem a little bit. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think. Um just coming back to the questions of good versus bad, bad people. Um, I'm not sure if hanging around with the good people is always the way. Um, and I think you will have bad people, but that doesn't mean you should avoid them because it is those bad people who will help you through your journey, through awakening. And it is those bad people who will would you need to provide them with the right energy to bring them out of being bad. So I'm not sure just hanging around with the good people yeah. is a good thing. That's mm. uh, my, my understanding yeah. of it. Yeah. So it is impossible just to hang around good people anyway. Yeah, it can't be done. You're always going to have some, some bad people around. That's just the way it is. Uh, and uh, sometimes if you have the opportunity to kind of to support others on the spiritual path, that's, that's wonderful and we should certainly do that. Uh, but the main point here is that, you know, where do we choose our main conditioning in life? Uh, do we choose our main conditioning from someone like the Buddha? Or do we choose our main conditioning like from someone like a philosopher or something like that? Or from, you know, some other worldly person? Uh, so the question is, what do we take as our main guidance in life? That is kind of the critical thing. Yeah. That is the Kalyanamitta. The Kalyanamitta is a friendship that you have with somebody. Yeah. yeah, so you kind of, that is the main friendship, the main friendship, the main inspiration for your life. That is a significant thing here. Yeah. But at the end of the, uh, you're right. Yeah, we have to kind of deal with all kinds of people. And sometimes uh, our own spiritual progress uh, depends on how we treat everyone, including the people who don't have good qualities. Yeah, so you treat them well. You try to help them in whatever way you can. Yeah, to maybe show them the way. Yeah, yeah come to the Dhamma talk tonight. Yeah, <laughs> or whatever it is, and bring people around. Uh, and so, in that sense, I, I agree with you. Huh? Good evening, Bhante. Thanks for coming over. I hope you have regard from uh, jet lag. Thanks for your time. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Uh, two quick questions, please. Uh, basically, I'm seeking your guidance on something guaranteed in life, which is uh, problems. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the, the two things, one is that uh, we do tend to, actually personally I do, do tend to dwell on things when something occurs. And the other thing is that uh, another thing guaranteed in life is that uh, you're going to get angry, especially in my case, that when you uh, let down by people and um, you get angry. So present moment awareness, I'm fully aware of it, but sometimes I feel I'm a bit too late to catch it. Uh -huh. 
So I'm seeking your guidance, oh. some practical steps. Oh, yeah, yeah. What is the yeah. best way forward on okay. to deal with these two situations? Sure. Thank Absolutely. You. Easy. Yeah. And that's, that's uh, yeah. I'm very happy, to, very delighted to. Uh, to <laughs> so the first one is you're saying about the problems in life, right? Uh, and that they're all problems. And when they are, you dwell on them. So you come here to meditate and you think about those problems. Uh, and this is kind of part of the, you know, issue. So one of the most important things in meditation that supports meditation practice uh, is the idea of right view. Huh? And uh, I think people are not aware of this, uh, but when you go back to the suttas of the Buddha, this is one sutta found in the Satipatthana Sangyutta, the Connected Discourses on mi Mindfulness Meditation. Uh, the Buddha says there are two supports uh, of meditation practice. Those two things are Ujjukaditi, straight view, in other words, right view, and the other one is Sila, morality. Uh, yeah? So, have you got a Sri Lankan background? Do you understand these words? You have? Okay, good. So, I'm glad. I know I'm already talking to someone who probably knows these words really well, so that's great. And so, sila we know. Yeah? Sila is very important for meditation, because if you have sila, if you have morality, you will tend to feel good about yourself. If you feel good about yourself, it's easy to stay present, etc., etc. But the other thing which is often underestimated is the idea of right view. Huh? Right view is very powerful to enable you to be present here and now. And the reason is because right view makes you value the right things in life. We tend to value the wrong things. And when you value the wrong thing, your mind tends to, tends to um, uh, you know, regurgitate and kind of reflect endlessly on these things in life that actually probably don't have that much value. Huh? So one way of thinking about this that I kind of like, one of the you know, very profound and beautiful teachings of the Buddha is the idea of anicca, anitya, or anicca, impermanence, which can also be translated as unreliability, uncertainty, and all of these other things. And so what the Buddha says is that especially the five sense world, the world around us, is inherently unreliable. Yeah, it is always going wrong. I mean, look at that world now, the wars around the world, the climate change, artificial intelligence, they're saying now that it might destroy the world. Some people say it's going to save the world, other people say it's going to destroy the world. Uh, which one is right? Yeah, uncertainty. <laughs> and so all of these things uh, are there. And so after a while you realize the problem is not, the problem is that, uh, that the world is according to the Buddha, inherently unreliable. There is no solution to the problems in the world. It just goes round and round and round. It carries on again and again and again. One of the things I was talking about the other day, which I think is a nice way of thinking about this, is the distinction between linear time and circular time. Yeah, in the kind of the Western idea, the Christ, coming from the Christian background, uh, and also in many ways from the scientific background, time has a beginning. God creates the universe, yeah, and then it kind of goes up to Judgment Day. Kind of that's kind of the, the, the linear time, and there's some sort of movement along that line. So you end up over here. So everything has kind of a purpose. Everything has a meaning because we're heading somewhere. Linear time, everything seems to be meaningful in a certain way. Yeah, yeah? in a sense. Modern science is similar. You have the kind of Big Bang, and then you have the Big Whimper, or whatever, on the other end. Yeah, whatever you, you want to call this. Uh, and uh, but um, the Buddhist idea is circular time. That changes the equation dramatically because it means that there is no solution. You're not actually going anywhere. You're not heading anywhere. Always coming back again. Uh, yeah, it's like the in this life, your problems recur very often in a very similar kind of way. Uh, yeah. Recurring, then you die, and you come back again. You have to do all of these things again. Do you want to do all of these things again? <laughs> yeah, I don't want to do all of these things again. I mean, I've had a pretty good life, but I certainly don't want to do it again. Absolutely not. And that's only twice. Imagine if this kind of ding, 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 and kind of goes like that. That's really scary when you think about it. Yeah, it's really problematic. And so, um, and then you have that, not just that, but then you have the universe as well going in cycles, yeah? And what that means is that all of these things that we're kind of going through now in the world, all of that happens again as well, yeah? And so because we, we are, unfortunately, we only have a very small slice of uh, history that we can see. We can only see maybe 5,000 years, something like that, where we can understand human history. And over those 5,000 years, there has been certain kinds of progress, not not maybe in, in spiritual things necessarily, but certainly in technology or certain areas. And so it kind of, we have this biased view that there is always progress, but actually from a larger point of view, there isn't. From a larger point of view, always coming back to the same thing again. Huh? 
And this is kind of really, yeah, it's yucky, yeah? <laughs> it's terrible, it's really unpleasant to see that, uh, because it means there is no solution. It means you are roaming around, yeah? It's like roaming has this idea of lack of purpose, uh, yeah? No, not going anywhere, we are roaming around, uh, yeah? And so once you understand this, you realize, why am I trying to solve all my problems in meditation? Uh, that's what people do in meditation, right? You're just sitting there anyway, might as well solve some problems. That's kind of a very common thing in meditation practice. Uh, and the mind just goes like this automatically. Yeah. Uh, you realize actually it's a waste of time. That is not how you solve your problems. Uh, yeah, because it's just another problem coming behind, another problem coming behind. The reason we're still here is because we tried to solve these problems in the past. Uh, yeah, so we're still here because of that reason. Uh. And so the answer uh, is, uh, yeah, the answer to this question then is that if you want to create your future, uh, you don't create the future. Uh, by solving the issues in your meditation practice. Uh, from a Buddhist point of view, the way to solve the future, to create a good future for yourself, uh, is the qualities of your heart. Uh, it's the stillness of the mind, your ability to meditate. That is where the future is created. Uh. So when you are sitting, closing your eyes, no, if you want to create a future, don't solve the problems, be peaceful. Then you are creating a good future. Uh. Then you're making good karma. Then you are building up those qualities that actually make you more resilient in this life and also create future goodness and future lives after that. Uh. So that is the, that is the path. Uh. Think like that, but you have to think it again and again and again. It takes a while for these things to sink in. Yeah, These are very profound ideas. I know with myself how long it takes for these things really to bite and to have an effect on the mind. So that was your first question. Huh? Second question. Huh? Sorry? Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, This idea of getting angry, uh, getting upset with people, right? How quickly it stops. So this is another thing which I think is a very useful way of thinking about this. And again, the, what we, one of the problems in life is that we often think that the way to be virtuous, the way to be kind, is to have more mindfulness. Yeah, people will tell you, be mindful, then you know what you're saying, you can stop yourself from saying bad things, you can say good things. Be mindful, you can uh, be aware of your thoughts, uh, and you can have move your thoughts in the direction of loving kindness instead of getting angry. They say be more mindful. Uh. The problem is it doesn't really work. Uh. And it doesn't work for two reasons. Uh. One is that even if you are mindful, sometimes we think we should do this. Yeah. So you're, you're mindful of what you're doing. Actually, I need to do this anyway. I need to tell this person off. Yeah, This person deserves it. They have done something bad. Now they need to be told off. Yeah, Or whatever it is. Uh, or this desire, this desire, we need to, you know, whatever. And you can always justify these things. So mindfulness often is not enough. That's reason number one. The second thing is that uh, sometimes we haven't got any mindfulness. I mean, I'm just amazed. I'm trying to walk down the street. I, I, sometimes I walk in the street and say hello to people. I say hi. And they just walk past. And I say they've got those earbuds in. Yeah? They have no idea what's going on around them. Completely out of it. Yeah? So you can say hello. They have no idea that you even exist you know, when you walk past them. And usually you stand out as a monk. But it, this doesn't actually seem to help very much in this case. It is nice. So. <laughs> and so you realize that for that reason, actually this idea of just be mindful, then you will be virtuous. It doesn't work. So what works then? And the answer is right view. That is what works. Right view is far more powerful than mindfulness. And the simile that I like to use to explain this is the simile of crossing the street. Yeah, so you come to a very busy street, like the high street in Oxford or whatever. Yeah, lots of cars all around. If you come to that street, do you just walk into the street or do you look left and right first of all? You, tend, you look left and right, right? And if you don't look left and right, you're nuts, yeah? So then you should be locked up in some, in the, you know, in some kind of institution because it's crazy to do that. We all know that's crazy. Yeah? And so, and it doesn't matter, even if you are on your mobile phone, even if you are, you know, watching TikTok movies as you're walking down the street or you're texting or whatever that you're doing. I don't know what people do. I don't have, I don't have a mobile phone. I have no idea what people do on the mobile phones. But whatever it is that they're doing, they're certainly not mindful. Yeah? They're completely out of it. And even though they're completely out of it, no idea what's going on, still they remember to look left and right when they come to that street. Yeah? So it's not because of mindfulness that they look left and right, but because of their view. They know it's dangerous. They have right view about what happens if you walk into that street without looking. And it's exactly the same thing with our life. If you understand 
the significance, the importance of being virtuous, then you will be very careful with everything you say, everything you do, even everything you think, because you know the urgency of this. You know life can be so short, you can die at any time. You don't know when the asteroid is coming, smash into the planet and kind of wipe out civilization. Basically, everything is so uncertain. That is kind of an extreme case. But the point is that things are so uncertain that now is the time to live in the right way. I don't have time to get angry. If I get angry now, I'm wasting the opportunity to be kind. I could die tomorrow. can't afford to waste that opportunity. You understand the urgency. And in many ways, the urgency of acting and living in the right way is greater than the blooming urgency of looking left and right for that street. Yeah? Okay, you might die, but the thing is that in Buddhism, death is a given anyway. We're all going to die. What is much more important than whether you live or die is how you live your life, because that actually does determine your future. We know we're going to die anyway, that has nothing to do with determining your future, but how you live does. And then, that is what we mean by right views. And so right view is in many ways far more important than actually the, uh, the mindfulness. Then you're going to become a super duper kind person. So work on that right view. Remember the importance of these things. Then you're going to be on the right track. Yeah. Bhante, it's a request. I want you to say something about Lord Buddha's love and compassion to my grandson. Okay. So you, you want me to say something about love and compassion to your grandson? Yeah. 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 Hello, grandson. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> nice to have you here. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful to have you here. Yeah. So what did the Buddha say about love and compassion? So the Buddha said that, uh, and that this is going to be this. I'm going to program this into you, yes, yeah, so that you will, you will kind of comes out to you at the right time, yeah. So this is going to be very hard to do. So, I'm gonna, so if you think what I'm saying is crazy, you are allowed to kind of to you know ask me question afterwards and tell me off or whatever it is that you like to do. So what the Buddha said about love and compassion, he says that. Are you ready for this? Yeah? Okay, so what he said was that even if bandits pin you to the ground and they take out the saw and they saw you apart limb by limb, can you imagine someone doing that? It's terrible, right? It's really terrible. How can bandits do that? It's really unfair. You haven't done anything, they just bring out the saw and they start kind of sawing you apart limb from limb. Even if someone does that to you, you should have love and kindness and compassion for them. What do you reckon? Can? Yeah? Yes! Wow! <laughs> okay. Now that's good. Yeah, you have the right idea. So this, this is what the Buddha is asking us to do. In other words, never be angry, never be upset with anyone. And the reason is that uh, people in the world don't really know what they're doing here. Yeah? People in the world are trapped in their own way, so always be kind to everyone in the world. They are suffering. Uh, they have a problem. Uh, and they don't really understand how to get out of that. Uh, then compassion and kindness is always right. Uh, make sense? Yeah, okay, sadhu. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Ajahn. Yeah, yeah. Just a small question now. Yeah. Um, we were talking about good and bad people mm. and about Kalyanamitta. And can you please explain the way that Buddha explained about how to find a Kalyanamitta mm. and the difference um, of a Kalya, like who is not a Kalyanamitta? Yeah. So if you can explain that. You have to found us. them now. You're here. You found them. You've already done it. You, have, you know how to do it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, so the, the way to find the Kalanamitta is to, uh, is again to observe yeah, people and observe the world. And uh, so you have to, it takes a lot of careful judgment, a careful kind of uh, uh, consideration of the situation. Yeah, who are the people who are really worthy of respect? Who are the people who are worthy of things? And uh, when you do that, you will tend to discover yeah, what, what actually who is worthy of respect. It's not that hard to see. Yeah? Some people have really good qualities. Uh, the Buddha is the prime example. The Buddha is the greatest spiritual genius in the history of humanity. Yeah? The suttas is the greatest history in the world, uh, the greatest literature in the world. Uh, yeah? The word of the Buddha is the greatest literature uh, in the history of the world by a mile, by a long shot. Uh, yeah? It's just so, so beautiful. And so you then, you 
you know, you already, obviously already have some faith in the Buddha, otherwise you wouldn't be here. You go to the suttas and then you learn, you know, you follow those, uh, or you, those friends or those people in your life who then support you in this practice, to help you in going the right direction. One, so this is one important way of understanding who is Ikanamitta, is what effect do they have on you? So those people have a good effect on you, so you tend to be more peaceful, more calm, having more metta, more understanding, having less defilements in the mind, less anger, etc. Those people have that effect on you, they will be your kalanamittas. Those people have the opposite effect, they will be your papamittas, your kind of difficult friends. That is one way of judging that. Another, yeah, so, um, yeah, does that answer your question? Huh? Yeah, okay, good enough, okay. Good. Please, sir. So me, who, me? Me first. Uh, all right, I'll uh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for being a good friend, first of all, in the Dhamma, yeah. and to everyone here for being good friends as well, to us. And uh, I hope you enjoyed the evening um, and that you got something out of it. And even if you don't think you have, hopefully you've been conditioned. Because <laughs> conditioning just happens, whether we like it or not. So, yeah, well done for being here. And... Uh, yeah, I guess I just wanted to say a few words about um, the monastery that we have now um, started to establish in Boar's Hill in Oxford, because you're all local, or a lot of you are local. So um, it'd be really wonderful if we can make this a place of spiritual friendship and spiritual practice, because the practice is so subtle and so... Um, rich in a way, you know, it's not enough just to meditate, it's not enough just to be mindful, but the practice includes the way we relate to each other, the way we think about life, the way we understand life, um, you know, the attitudes we bring, the motivations we bring to the to the way we live and to the people that we're around, and also doing good, you know, acting in wholesome ways that bring about uh, alleviation of suffering. So, uh, and also, of course, to meditate, right? To develop good qualities or wholesome qualities in the mind and to gradually undermine the qualities that take us away from the present moment, that take us away from being kind and doing the things we know we should do. But unfortunately, our minds are not conditioned that way yet. So we need one another. And I think, uh, you know, a monastery is hopefully a place that people can come to and seek that spiritual friendship and encouragement and also good influences from one another. Um, this doesn't only mean that you come to learn from the monastics, but the monastics can also um, feel that we have a lot of meaning in our lives from being around good people too. So uh, I would really like to invite everybody to come and visit to be a part of the community and to, um, yeah, just help us develop the place so that we can also train other women to become bhikkhunis because there's only me who lives here more or less full time and Venerable Upeka who's come to visit me for several months and will hopefully come back again. But otherwise we're basically doing, we're the sole representatives of the bhikkhuni sangha in this country. There's no one else yet. And we need to have that equality. You know, this is also part of, uh, of developing um, a community that's really inspiring to others. You know, if we have inequalities there, if we treat each other as less than, or, you know, not give the appropriate conditions to some members of the community based on gender or based on whoever they are, then we can't really say we're practicing Buddhism fully. So, um, I just want to encourage you all to be a part of this, and uh, I think Ajahn Brahmali can say the rest because the rest I probably don't yeah, have okay, a lot yeah. more to say, but thank you for supporting us. Right. I, I don't <laughs> think there is any rest, but anyway, I'll say it anyway. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, it's, it's, it's wonderful. I think it's one of the things that is often underestimated in the Buddhist world, that uh, if we don't have a kind of the four, it's called the four assemblies in Buddhism, the four parises, uh, Buddhism is not really complete. Uh, and the four assemblies is the monks, the nuns. Yeah, the nuns are one of the four assemblies, and then we have the lay women and lay men. Yeah, so four assemblies. And when we have all of those four, then we have a nice balance in Buddhism. And so I think it's really wonderful and really great that we have the Bhikkhuni Sangha now coming back again in force. Also here in, right here in England, at the heart of England. Must, Oxford must be the heart of England, I think. And uh, so, <laughs> So what a, what a wonderful thing that is, yeah, we have, it's happening around the world in many different places, in Australia, in, uh, in um, 
in uh, Sri Lanka and in many other places as well. And that is such a powerful and wonderful thing for Buddhism. It makes Buddhism a stronger religion. The Sangha of Bikinis was laid down by the Buddha and it's such a shame that it was lost in large parts of the world, but now it's coming back, hopefully in force again. So Venerable Chanda is doing all the hard pioneering work in the UK. It's very difficult to be by yourself. Yeah, okay, she gets some, she gets, I'm sure, very good help from Venerable Pekka, but still she is the, has to kind of take the uh, leadership role and kind of be there at all the time to do this. Uh, <laughs> and so it's very, it's very hard, but I think it's really worthy of support. And over time, I think there's a very good chance that it will be a really nice and established Sangha of Bikunis right here in, uh, well, in Oxford. Is that, yeah, yeah, hopefully right here in Oxford. Uh, so please, if you have the ability to <laughs> support or if you have the ability to go on a visit and check it out and see, uh, see if you, you know, if you want to be involved in whatever way, that would be a wonderful, beautiful uh, thing worthy of triple sadhu. So shall we end up with triple sadhu? Uh, yeah, maybe yeah? just a few more practical Three, notes more practical ones, yeah, okay. that I've missed out is that you mm. can also come and volunteer. You can come and stay, but you can also come and just involve yourself. We have a few local people who come and they just involve themselves in the garden and water things when I'm not even aware. And I must say it brings me great delight not to have to even organize them, but they organize it for me, which is wonderful. So hopefully it can be a place that you can come and feel is like part of another home for you, you know. And we have some leaflets outside. We have some people outside with all the information, emails and events and things like that. And uh, we have a day retreat tomorrow, which I think is full in Oxford. And, or maybe there's one more place or something. I think one person did cancel, actually. So if anybody feels like coming, you can do so at last, last notice. And after that, a talk in Bristol. And after that, we have a three-day online retreat with me and my teacher, Ajahn Brahm. Uh, mainly with Ajahn Brahm, and I will be doing some evening uh, sessions. And also Venerable Upeka will give a talk as well about self-compassion, I think, isn't it? Is that what it's about, Venerable? <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to wait and see. <laughs> so all these teachings will also yeah. be put on our YouTube channel, so yeah. you can find them there. So thank you. And three big sadhus, which means excellent and well done. And awesome. And also, <laughs> sadhu, 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 sadhu. By the way, that's not really that great. So let's try it again. Okay. <laughs> that was just a little preparation. It was like a warm up. Okay. okay. Here we go properly. And also, Ajahn Brahm says, and he's our teacher, so he says you have to go ha 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 at the end of the last one. And it really works. Okay. Ready? <laughs> They're already doing it. <laughs> sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Great. It's really, <laughs> That's really I, good. It's really weird. I don't know about that one. <laughs> it works though. Does it? Huh? Yeah. yeah. Aren't what, you laughing? What does it do? A little huh? bit. It's like, it makes it, you happy. Makes it happy. All right. <laughs>